after a four-year run as the best team in the NFL, the Minnesota Vikings have finally been conquered by the New York Jets. The team that we beat to start our run of four consecutive Super Bowl titles has come back to end our historic streak. And now the Vikings, after a Super Bowl loss, try to put the pieces together for a run in the 2029 season. This past year was our first one having to build around the extension for quarterback Richard Hudick, who's now making $50 million a season. We've had to move on from some players, and of course this roster has been aging. NFL primes are relatively short compared to other sports. We have Richard Hudick, Justin Jefferson, Devin Cook, but now the team construction does get more challenging when you have one of the highest paid quarterbacks and the highest paid receiver. When you look at how we fared last year, we still had an elite level offense, but the defense took a big step back. We are one of the worst pass rushing teams, and we had a bottom 10 run defense. We went into the offseason for 2029 with $91 million in cap space and a few key players to think about re-signing. The main area of concern was the offensive line with Wyatt Teller and Lane Quincy being free agents. There were also contributors like Alex Richards, James Cook, and Legereus Sneed. Ultimately, most of these free agents were not going to be brought back, especially the veterans that we tried to bring in for last year when the front seven was very thin. The Vikings do bring back Bernard Johnson, the 26-year-old defensive tackle. Justin Tucker is still going to be playing, and he's now down to an 84 overall, and we're going to franchise tag him to keep him in Minnesota. When it came to other players regressing, there wasn't a lot that surprised me here, and when you have superstar X-Factor players, this makes it even better, because Justin Jefferson had no regression whatsoever. And the same is true for Cam Dantzler. Perhaps at 31 years old, they'll start regressing, but for now, they're still at the top of their games. You do have to pay attention, though, to the other players creeping up in age. Andrew Booth, Keyshawn Oldham, Lewis Seen, Jordan Davis... These are not elite players, and they're about to become 30 years old. The Vikings also had Rashawn Evans and Deion Dawkins retire, creating three potential holes along the offensive line. The Vikings do not bring back James Cook, and do not bring back Legereus Sneed. We tried to bring back Daniil Hunter on a cheap one-year deal to be depth, but he wanted the test free agency instead. We also did not try to bring back Jalen Rice, as he only had three and a half sacks while playing over 2,000 downs in his NFL career. Drake Jackson also did not return. So to try and have some stability, we offered a contract to Lane Quincy, and he turned down a three-year extension. Ben Dodson has been basically our sixth lineman for a while, and he's going to stay in that role, signing a two-year deal. Alex Richards was a free agent, and he also signed an extension to stick around. Wyatt Teller, still a high-level guard, but he wanted to test free agency instead of re-signing. The Vikings only brought back five players in that initial re-sign period. That meant Minnesota was going to be pretty busy in free agency. There were suddenly openings available across the offensive line, but most importantly, the defense is needing some young talent, and you can't go get that in free agency. You've got to build a bit through the draft while finding the right veterans to plug gaps in the meantime. Wyatt Teller was one of the top free agents available, and a lot of teams were interested. I felt like pass rusher was the Vikings' biggest need, and free agency didn't offer a lot of top-end talent. There were players like Josh Sweat and Marcus Davenport available, so there were some decent opportunities, and one that caught my attention was 26-year-old pass rusher Nate Burse. He's coming off a four-year run in which he put together 12 and a half sacks. He is from Minnesota, wants to be close to home, so he had a lot of interest in coming to the Vikings. And Minnesota's got to basically start over at edge rusher, so it seemed to be a really good fit. But how about a veteran who's proven a little bit more, like Josh Sweat? Felt like he was worth a one-year deal, asking for $10.5 million. 
Minnesota then offers a contract to Kyler Gordon to play the slot role, and then shifted attention to the offensive line. There were a couple players under 30 years old that could be signed for multi-year deals. And one of the top rated options available was Bernard Connor, a left tackle who handles finesse rushers with ease, but doesn't handle power very well. He was still one of the best options and Minnesota offered a two year deal. That was followed by a boosted one year offer of $14 million for Wyatt Teller, but this was said to be very competitive. Of those offers, the only ones accepted were by the edge rushers Nate Burse and Josh Sweat. Wyatt Teller instead took less money to go to the Baltimore Ravens. With Teller no longer an option, the focus went back to Lane Quincy and trying to get a three-year deal done with the 81 overall center. We offered him a multi-year contract, but so did seven other teams. Next move was to go find a backup running back behind Devin Cook and JoJo Hall. Hadn't been very productive throughout his career, but there wasn't really a productive power back available, so Hall got the one-year offer. Deals were then accepted by left tackle Bernard Connor, Kyler Gordon, and that was it. Lane Quincy went to Dallas on a three-year offer worth around $32 million. And Jalen Rice ended up getting a deal with the LA Chargers. This left us with potential holes at left guard and maybe center depending on how we shuffled things around. And we had to still continue building front seven depth. Rudy Woodard, a 73 overall defensive end, was offered a one-year contract. JoJo Hall ended up declining the Vikings offer previously. And we ended up signing Tyrion Davis-Price instead. We also got Rudy Woodard under contract. But with the top offensive lineman no longer available, we had to then offer to Kevin Dotson just the $2 million offer to potentially be the starting left guard. I still felt like there was something missing in this front seven, and I wasn't sure how much the draft would be able to fix the problems. Luckily for us, there was a player on the trade block that was very intriguing. The Colts 24-year-old defensive lineman John Riddick, who was coming off a 5.5 sack campaign and was a former second round pick. This was a player I felt the Vikings had to go and get. We traded Dave McElroy and a 6th round pick to go and acquire Riddick to be that starting defensive end, to play the role that Dion Robinson once did and to potentially give us an option to edge rush because of his athleticism at 270 pounds. I felt like this gave the Vikings a much better chance to have a true edge rushing presence. However, I knew that there was still a need to go get young defensive talent and that was the focus of the NFL Draft. It's our first first round pick since selecting Devin Cook. And of course the Vikings had a very long wait. The Texans were the first team to go and select a quarterback, but not the most interesting team that ultimately did. Later in the first round, the Detroit Lions selected Donovan Collins out of Old Dominion. Is the Howie Thompson era coming to an end? Thompson is an 82 overall at 27 years old, and he hasn't led the Lions to any reasonable success. He's kind of put them in the position Kirk Cousins put the Vikings into. So perhaps the Lions were starting over. What could the Vikings do at 31st overall? The top player on the big board was Kamani Gary, a cornerback out of Texas A&M. Six foot three man corner who has 4'4 speed. That is rare athleticism to even be available late in the first round. However... It was going to be a little bit of a risk taking him, not having a full scouting report. But it felt like he was the one player with the upside to potentially be a really high value pick at 31. The Vikings made the pick. Gary has hidden development. That looked like a pretty good selection. No trading here for Minnesota. On to the second round and now pick 63. And the Vikings selected pass rusher Braden Selvey. Coming back later in the third round, they went to the defensive line. 
and this time added a really athletic defensive tackle in Casey Wagner. A player who has athleticism at 302 pounds to rush from the interior. The Vikings spent their first three picks on defense, and finally their first offensive selection in the fourth round was running back Isaiah Northrup. With hidden development, could he be the backup to Devin Cook? Moving on, Minnesota addressed their offensive line depth, taking Xavier Sherman in the fifth round. Their final pick in the seventh round was used on a linebacker, Raheem Colbert, to provide some inside linebacker depth. Unlike the previous year's class, this one appeared to be much more promising, and it was finally a chance to replenish this defensive talent that has begun to move on or age. I felt like this was a huge hit for Minnesota, getting a player like Kamani Gary in the first round. And then a player with upside like Braden Selvey, although maybe this was a little bit of a reach. Casey Wagner at 72 overall did feel like a player who could develop into a really good starter with day one pass rushing upside. And then a contributor at running back behind Devin Cook, Isaiah Northrup, hidden development, just a massive bonus here. This felt like a promising class. I was also interested in the Lions quarterback that they selected, and Donovan Collins is a 72 overall with hidden development. It's not likely he would start right away though, but consider Howie Thompson only has two years left on his contract. Once we got to preseason, we still had a couple signings to make. We brought in Trey McBride to help replace Dave McElroy after he was traded to Indianapolis. And then we sign the backup quarterback of all backup quarterbacks, Jacoby Brissett. Minnesota ended up having a very successful preseason on both sides of the football. They produced well on offense, just as you would normally expect. Jacoby Brissett did well with the second team. And Tyrion Davis-Price had four touchdowns and the best yards per carry on the team. And the Viking defense looked to be promising with Nate Burst having a terrific three games. So one year after losing the Super Bowl, how would this Minnesota team fare? The offensive line clearly wasn't as good as in years past, but you still have Richard Hudick and Justin Jefferson. Defensively, I was hopeful there would be a boost with players like Riddick, Burst, and Sweat hopefully providing an upgrade but I really felt like John Riddick could be the player to take this to being a top 10 defense once again if he was what I expected. First round rookie Kamani Gary would also be the starting slot corner, and there was a chance for some young players to play and develop. However, that meant we were going to de-emphasize Jordan Davis a little bit, as his pass rushing has lacked throughout his time in Minnesota and even Philadelphia. But that was our team going into week one with a debut game against the Detroit Lions. Minnesota lost their week one game to Detroit 20 to 17. Richard Hudick only had 147 yards in this game and Cam Akers put together 96 on the ground. Detroit's had some good seasons in the past and this wasn't a terrible loss. It was by three points. In week two, the Vikings lost another close game, this time to the LA Chargers. We gave up a great day passing to Justin Herbert with his three touchdowns and no interceptions, and the big day for Devin Cook was not enough. Torrey McLaughlin enjoyed a very big game, and the Vikings would lose to another LA team the next week. The LA Rams, with Christian Winter throwing for four touchdowns and 356 yards. We've had a really good secondary for a long time, but they are not playing up to their expectations now. Minnesota opened 0-3 on the year, and with the best run defense on paper because everybody would just throw it against them. In those first three games, Richard Hudick only had four touchdown passes to three interceptions. Devin Cook was playing well, but one player noticeably quiet was Justin Jefferson. Averaging just over 30 yards a game. That is not normal. In their fourth game, the Vikings finally woke up 
with a 500-yard performance and 35 points on the board. Richard Hudick had his best game of the year, Tyrion Davis-Price found the end zone three times, and Will Stockton was the leading receiver. The defense also stepped up, holding the Pittsburgh Steelers to only 13 points. This brought the Vikings to a 1-3 record and a matchup against the undefeated Chicago Bears, who stayed unbeaten, defeating Minnesota with ease. Two interceptions and no touchdowns for Richard Hudick. Hunter Poole, the Bears' second-year quarterback, had himself a very nice game. And the Viking defense also allowed 180-plus yards on the ground. The only thing consistently working at this stage for Minnesota was their ground game. But they were 1-4 before Cleveland dropped them to 1-5. 38-14. The Vikings aren't just losing, but they're getting embarrassed. Multi-score losses. After only six games, they were four back of the Lions and Bears. Ticket sales were dropping rapidly. U.S. Bank Stadium nowhere close to full capacity. The Vikings had to slash ticket prices across the board. They also cut prices on team merchandise on top of the Juicy Lucy Burger. Would a $5 Juicy Lucy bring fans to the stands? Barbecue, hot dish, all of it on sale. I'm from Minnesota and I have no idea what a blueberry muffin snow cone even is. One and five. A tough new reality for the Minnesota Vikings. This brought the season to the trade deadline. And the Vikings were set to have some of the biggest names on the team hit free agency at the end of the year. Justin Jefferson was, of course, the big name. Cam Dantzler, Jordan Davis, Lewis Seen. Would it actually make sense for the Vikings this year at 1-5 to trade some of these players that might not be part of their future? With a lack of young talent, especially on defense, that was really enticing. Quan Alexander is nearly 30 years old and he has become the team's number three receiver. And he was traded away to the Buffalo Bills along with a sixth round pick for Buffalo's third round pick in 2030. What about Jordan Davis at 29 years old? The run defense hasn't been very good with him and he's not giving us anything as a pass rusher. Jordan Davis was also traded with a fifth round pick to the New England Patriots for their second round pick projected very late. Andre Sisco was then traded for a fifth round pick. Kyler Gordon went for a sixth round pick. I felt like these were the trades Minnesota needed to make to acquire picks, allow some young players to play, but also leave the window open for a turnaround by not trading away the most key players on the team. I felt like those trades were all fair value for both sides. And that led Minnesota into the next half of their schedule. And the Vikings responded with a win against the Atlanta Falcons. They gave up a lot of points, but they showed they could score with Devin Cook running in three touchdowns, scoring a 99-yard touchdown, and getting the Vikings their second win. In their next game against the Green Bay Packers, the Vikings win another close game, putting up 28 points on offense and getting their second win in a row. Was a season turnaround still possible? You had the Bears and Lions way out in front. Minnesota trying to get back into at least the wild card picture. They would next meet up with the Chicago Bears. They lost the first meeting by multiple scores, but this looked to be a very different Vikings team. Let's go, 10 minutes left to go in the game. Vikings up by two. Richard Hudick can't escape the pass rush, and he's sacked by Roquan Smith. The ball goes back to Chicago with under eight minutes to go. Hunter Poole across the middle, taking the Bears into the red zone. A third and two run, gets the first down. Bears getting closer to taking the lead. Minnesota just trying to keep them from reaching the end zone. Third and two from the three. 
And Hunter Poole hit on the play and throws incomplete. Chicago adds a field goal but only goes up by one. With five and a half to go, Richard Hudick. Big play action pass across the middle, hooking up with Will Stockton who continues to impress. And later it's Hudick outside, throwing complete to Alex Richards as they get back into Chicago territory. Facing a third and five, Hudick tries to throw to the sideline and throws it away. That brings out Justin Tucker. He's like 40 years old. It's a 57-yard field goal try, and he drills it with ease. Minnesota back in front by two points. Hunter Poole rolling away from pressure, and Josh Ballard just chased him into a sack. Chicago gets to a third down and long, and the Vikings bring the pressure, ending the Chicago drive. All they had to do is run the clock out. Third and three. This is the rookie Isaiah Northrup. He doesn't get it. And Devin Cook was hurt earlier in this game. Fourth and one. Minnesota gives it to the rookie. And Northrup gets loose in the secondary. And brings it all the way for a 41-yard touchdown. The first of his NFL career. Sealing a Vikings win over Chicago. Their third in a row bringing their record to four and five on the season. The Vikings year had new life with this winning streak helped sparked by the rookie Northrup. And his first touchdown was big and he was gonna be needed to play a lot more going forward with Devin Cook tearing his quad. At the same time, Cam Dantzler broke his collarbone and this meant two key stars wouldn't play for quite some time. And it's really unfortunate for Devin Cook, who was in the middle of a career year, even with the Vikings not playing great. Some of the younger free agents were then offered contracts, with Will Stockton accepting a three-year extension worth $21 million. And 25-year-old safety Harold Carter, four years, $20 million accepted. Minnesota at four and five, still a lot of work to do. The next test was their second meeting with Detroit. They lost the opener against them, and this game would be close going into the late minutes. Minnesota down three, under four minutes to go. Hudick complete again. It's Will Stockton in key moments. Vikings get to a third and 10, and Hudick finds Justin Jefferson shy of the marker, and Minnesota would settle for a field goal. Nearly blocked but Justin Tucker tied the game at 24. Howie Thompson and the Lions take over at their 22. Thompson is intercepted on the play by first round rookie Kamani Gary. And it's a pick six. Another big mistake for Howie Thompson. We've seen this time and time again. He always ends up throwing the crucial interception. The Lions were down seven, trying to rally to get those points back. And that's when Brandon Beasley has the ball punched out of his hands. Vikings recover, and the defense now gets the Vikings the win. Their fourth consecutive, evening their record at five and five. Anything was possible now with the way they were playing. And perhaps the young players figuring things out made this a very different team for the second half of the season. Their momentum would come to an end in their next game, however, with a 24-3 blowout at the hands of the New York Giants. Minnesota couldn't run the ball one bit without their star, Devin Cook, and Aziz Ojulari had a massive day Taking advantage of a banged up Vikings offensive line as Clay Kutcher is the newest injured player with a broken tailbone. And the Vikings would lose the following week to Baltimore, struggling to generate much offensively. And that's when they lost safety Lewis Seen. The injuries were really adding up for a team that's already developed a couple weaknesses in the last couple years. The offensive line front seven, secondary, all looked like issues at this stage. 
One bit of positive news is that Kamani Gary has superstar development, and he was getting to play a lot now without Cam Dantzler. Minnesota was 5-7, needing a win against the Bengals in a now-or-never game, and they were blown out by a score of 49-10. Slamming the door on any hopes this season may have still had. Joe Burrow, five touchdowns, 370 plus yards. The defense just didn't have it anymore. And with the Vikings at five and eight, the decision was made to place every injured player on injured reserve and pack it in for the rest of the 2029 campaign. And that even included Devin Cook, who was only a week away from returning. There was no need to rush him back or have him play out the rest of this season. Minnesota continued to add young players to the roster as they did at the trade deadline. Players who could be re-signed to add depth in future seasons. We signed, I think, six players off of opposing practice squads between this period and the trade deadline. Minnesota lost their next game to Green Bay for those of you that still thought there was a 1% chance. It was over. The Vikings lost the Super Bowl a year ago, and now they're a 7-10 team a year later. With the Lions and Bears way out in front dominating this division. It's a massive fall for this team that just went on a dynasty run. Richard Hudick had his worst season as a starting quarterback since his rookie year. Devin Cook... Who knows what could have happened with a full year of playing time. Justin Jefferson's production did recover by the end of the year. And Will Stockton somehow managed 81 catches, almost 1,100 yards, with no touchdowns. One of the most inefficient touchdown scorers in the NFL. Left tackle Bernard Connor may not have been a good signing for us, as he allowed 15 sacks this year, and his one big weakness was too much. And defensively... The investments did not pay off in terms of creating the pass rush I was hoping for. Josh Sweat had six sacks, but Nate Burst had more sacks in the preseason than he did the regular season. And John Riddick didn't give us much of a boost either, perhaps being a better run defender for us this year. The Vikings only scored 23.2 points per game, bottom 10 in the NFL. They only generated 32 sacks, bottom 10 in the NFL, negative six turnover differential, one of the worst teams in terms of takeaways. We saw Patrick Mahomes win the MVP this year, but a number of awards going to those rivals in the NFC North. The Lions and Bears brought home a lot of hardware this season, and it's tough to watch now after our fall from the top. Hunter Poole looks to be taking the Bears into the right direction as he put together a 40-touchdown campaign, and he's off to a great start two years into his career. And I think Chicago's even building something nice on defense with players like Kendrick Breston breaking out this season. The Lions with Howie Thompson ended up playing really well this year. Perhaps the drafting of the new quarterback sparked Howie Thompson a bit, and Camp Akers has developed into one of the best running backs in the NFL and a 1,500-yard rusher for Detroit. Combine that with Jamison Williams and Brandon Beasley, you have a really good offense there. And Brandon Beasley has been great for a long time with the Lions. Detroit was the NFC's number one seed, and the Bears were the top wildcard team in the NFC, with the Vikings nowhere to be seen in this postseason. Neither the Bears nor the Lions would make it to the NFC Championship game. The Bears won their first playoff game, but they both lost in the divisional round. And the new champions this year are the Dallas Cowboys, who defeat the New York Jets, who return to the Super Bowl a second straight season. And yes, this confused me too. It says Dak Prescott's a Jet and Zach Wilson's a Cowboy. That is accurate. They swapped quarterbacks this year in free agency and then met in the Super Bowl. Trayvon Diggs had a pick six of Dak Prescott, 
was the Super Bowl MVP, and Zach Wilson now has back-to-back -back rings. I know that's a lot to take in. But where does that leave the Minnesota Vikings? It appears the dynasty is over, and the road to the top looks a little bit different than it did before. There are still holes along this offensive line. Justin Jefferson's getting older. We still need edge rushers. And we have some pretty key free agents to think about bringing back alongside Richard Hudick. So now, seeing the Vikings lose a Super Bowl, fall to 7-10, and, and not be able to maintain their dominant level of play, especially with a couple teams on the rise in the NFC North, does it now appear to be a little more interesting to see if this team can successfully replace a lot of the players that made the dynasty what it was and try to get back to the top once again with a team that would undoubtedly look very different. The changes have been rolling in these last two years and based on the age of the roster still at a lot of our key contributors, more change is yet to come. I hope you enjoyed this video and I have thoroughly enjoyed putting together these last two in the way that I have. My strategy for the series became let's move ahead to the future and let's see how long this lasts and if the Vikings need help at any point. Along the way I've of course been managing the roster as I normally would. It's been a lot more challenging but now it looks like there's actually a bit more to do now. So would you like regular episodes to return starting with the next offseason? Because this team actually has some rebuilding to do. Let me know down below in the comments section. I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I want to see your thoughts down there. And I will see you all next time. Thank you for the support. Have a great day.